So our next guest, um, I've known for a while, uh, but I'm still going to read off the card just uh, to be sure, but his name is Ken Lawson. Um, he is, uh, he teaches criminal law at the University of Hawaii, um, and he is also the co-director of the Hawaii Innocence Project. He did have a successful law practice in Cincinnati until an addiction to prescription painkillers resulted in the loss of his law license. He pleaded guilty to a felony drug charge and was sentenced to 24 months in prison. Some of his high-profile clients include NFL stars Deion Sanders, Albert Icky Woods, and musician Peter Frampton, but I'm sure he'll tell you all about that as uh, we invite Ken Lawson up to be our next storyteller. I think the common theme tonight has been love um, and kindness. And I didn't grow up um, really believing in that philosophy. And I think the person who showed me truly what love is and what forgiveness is uh, and being non-judgmental is my wife, Marva, who sits there uh, 35 years this coming August. Uh, we met in high school, and it wasn't until I heard some of our panel members talk about the effects that, we, uh, that, that, that people like me have on the family that's not in prison, that what a drug addict and alcohol like me does to a family. Because see, when I'm using drugs and I'm drinking, I'm, what I'm thinking is, just leave me alone. I ain't hurting you. I'm in the basement by myself, right? You go upstairs, whatever, I'm not bothering you. But see, when my son, who's, who's now uh, in his 10th year in the Marines, came to court and fell out when the judge sentenced me to 24 months and I heard his wails in the, in the courtroom. And I saw my wife crying. And I had to tell her when I got sober in 2007, that not only am I a drug addict, because she knew that, not only am I an alcoholic, but I haven't been paying our bills. My habit was $1,000 a day for the last two years of my using. Percocet, Percodan, Oxycontin, cocaine, marijuana. And so the house is in foreclosure. Your cars are going to be repossessed. I ain't been paying the kids tuition. I'm about to have you and your family all over the news for shit that I did. But they ain't got no victims. I'm not hurting nobody but myself. And to have my son come to see me in prison after he graduated from boot camp. My, I went to prison and my son went to boot camp the same month. And when he graduated, he came to West Virginia Morgantown to see me. And I, you know, when you come out of, uh, into the uh, uh, visiting room, right, you come in with your little dress prison uniform on, and here he is in his class A's. And the humiliating uh, uh, effect it had to me to sit down with my son, who I was his hero. And I'm sitting in prison. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was born in a mental institution. My mother had me uh, in 1963, and she was white, she was Italian. And when her family found out that she was pregnant by a black man, her oldest brother broke her collarbone at the dinner table, and the family sent her to a mental hospital. That's where I was born. I was then placed into an orphanage until I was two years old. I was adopted into a family where everybody in that family was dark-skinned African-American. So even from a young age, I just didn't feel like I fit in. And it was always just constant hole in my soul that I can't express, that no matter where I went, I felt apart from and never a part of. I could sit in class thinking, everybody knows what life is about. For some reason, I don't feel a part of you. I don't feel connected to you. And so I walk around pretending that I know what's going on. But really, I'm just afraid. I'm afraid that if you get to see who I know is in here, you're not going to like it. I can't let you see who I really am. And so I start running my life. Uh, really believing that the only way I can feel this emptiness in the hole in my soul is if I had to become somebody. Because I still feel less than. That if I can somehow make a lot of money, become a lawyer, become somebody strong, and get a car and, and, and a house and marry a beautiful wife and have some kids and a dog and, and no cats, because I can't stand cats, but... <laughs> right? But if I can get these things, it's going to fill this hole in my soul. Because, see, I don't know how to be happy as I go through my journey. 
Happiness is always something that's going to come once I get to a certain point in my life. Whether I'm sitting in grade school, I'm sitting there thinking, maybe when I get to junior high, I'll be happy. Then I get to junior high, I'm like, after 30 days of this, I'm like, I ain't happy here either. Maybe it's when I get to high school, I'll be happy. And it just goes on and on like that. Maybe when I meet the right woman, I'll be happy. Maybe when my kids start acting the way I need them to act, I'll be happy. Maybe if my coworkers would just behave when I go to work today, I can be happy. <laughs> right? Because I need the world to be in a certain way so that I can be okay with me. I need certain things to happen in order for me to be okay in here. And I don't know how to enjoy the moment because I can't stay in the moment because I don't know how to get me off of me. See, I'm sitting here thinking about what I'm going to do when I leave here or what I did earlier. But I don't know how to be present with you here right now. And the only time I can live is right now. But how can I stay here? How can I get me off of me? And so uh, I went on a, to, my wife got pregnant in her senior year. I went on to college. We got married. We had two kids in college. And I went to law school. And I in, in, ended up getting a, a good job after law school. As, as Nick said, I represented Deion Sanders. I remember getting Deion's case. Most of these young people don't know who he is, but back then he was like his, he, you know, he, he was about, a, and nobody know who Peter Frampton is, but some. <laughs> but you know, my thought was, if, if I win Deion's case, then my law firm would be set, I'll be happy. And so we tried five charges to a jury and he found not guilty in all of them. And an hour later, I go back to his penthouse and he, he's about to play the Pittsburgh Pirates that night. So we celebrate for an hour. He goes down to the stadium to play the Pirates, and I walk back to my law firm, and this hole is still in my soul. And I'm sitting there thinking, I've got everything that I ever wanted. Why in the hell am I not happy? And see, to a man like me, it doesn't look like I'm struggling with this spiritual malady. It doesn't look like there's something that this is a God hole that needs to be filled. What it looks like to a man like me is I just ain't got enough stuff. Or it looks like to me, maybe if, maybe if my wife you know, does what I want her to do, then right, it looks like everybody else is my problem. And as long as you're my problem, I don't have a solution. That means I got to wait until you behave in a certain way in order for me to be okay. And so the, the best thing that happened to me was when, when the judge finally, the DEA was investigating me for getting prescriptions illegally. Right? So now I'm on my way to prison and all this stuff. And, and, and I, I went to and got sober in 2007. In February, two, my sobriety is February 2nd, 2007. And when I walked in there, that man said, hey, look here, man. Your problem wasn't alcohol and drugs. That was your solution. Your problem was you suffer from a spiritual malady. Your problem is in here, your belief system. And so I'm thinking because I'm not using no more, I'm okay, right? And so about three months later, I'm going to AA meetings, and I text my, no, my wife sent me a text. She's like, you know what? You ain't drinking no more, but you're still an asshole. <laughs> right? So I'm sitting there thinking, well, well what, right? Because I hadn't started practicing those spiritual principles, right? My sponsor, my sponsor told me, look here, man, you ran your life in the penitentiary. You're going to be gone in a couple of years. So in these, between these two years, why don't you let God run your life and your job is to be of service to him and his children? Why don't you try uh, living a selfless life instead of a selfish life, right? And so I started doing things, and he said, now, when you do these things, do them without expecting nothing in return. Because, see, I'm the type of man that if I clean up the house, I remember one time telling my sponsor, man, I, I couldn't work. My license was suspended. So Marva working, I clean up the house. She come home, and she don't say thank you. I made dinner and everything, right? She don't say thank you. <laughs> she don't say thank you, right? So I go tell my sponsor. I was like, I, I made dinner, cleaned the house, put the kids to bed, right, babe, I made. She didn't say thank you. He said, what was you doing it for? You the daddy. You the husband, right? What's your motive? Because if you was doing it to be of help without expecting nothing in return, then it doesn't matter whether she thanks you or not, does it? You did it because you wanted her to thank you so you could feel good about yourself. That's some selfish shit. Don't you think, Ken? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I, well, it is, but it didn't seem like that to me. My mind's like, you know, I've been a nice guy, right? <laughs> anyway. But, but we lost the house, we lost the cars, we lost everything. I'm all over the news for two years. Uh, we, we ended up living back in my mother's house. Now, here's this man that represented Dion, Peter, and all these, right? Back in his, in his old high school bedroom in his mama's house. See, for a drug addict like me, there came a time in, in, in our household where there was no more tears. 
There was no more please stop. There was no more will you quit. I gave my wife and my kids shark eyes. That when they saw me coming, it was just dead eyes. You hear me? This is the stuff that we do to people around us. And so I had no idea until I heard some of these sisters, the post-traumatic stress that I put you through. <laughs> and I'm sorry. But what I'm grateful of is this, is that I found a loving God. Marla found a job. She came into that house, my mama's house. She said, look here, I'm waiting for the next shoe to drop. She said, guess what? There's a place that will take me as a psychiatrist. Uh, she had to serve two years in an underserved area. And she said, it's in Hawaii. And I said, you must be out of your mind. We've never been to Hawaii. <laughs> I said, ain't no other place. I see Waikiki and, and Diamond Head when I watch Truth and Comedy. What was that Bob Barker show of prices, right? And she said, no, I said, why not come? What's going on? And so, and so we had our furniture in storage, and she was just coming out to interview. And we sold furniture and got her a ticket to come out here on a prayer, like she says, on a wing and a prayer. And she got the job. And then when I, I had a case pending in, in Ohio, so I had to keep coming out here and flying back. And so I got with this, this program called the Lawyers and Judges Assistance Program in Hawaii, in Hawaii. And I went and shared my story. And they said, hey, do you want to go to the law school at, at, at UH and tell the law students your story? I said, hell no. I don't want to go. I don't want to go tell no law students that I'm a drug addict and fucked up my life. I mean, what? I mean, I'm looking at this guy like he's crazy, right? So I called my sponsor back and I said, like, man, this guy tell me he want me to go talk to 100 law students. He said, what I tell you, man? He said, when you came into this program two years ago, I told you your life is, is you turned your life over to God. God's job is to run your life. Your job is to be a service to him and his children. Go share your story. And I did, and a month later, I went back to Cincinnati. I was since 24 months in prison. When I got out, they sent me to T.J. Mahoney Halfway House, which was way worse than prison. Fuck that, damn it. Anyway, they told me I only got a couple minutes. So. They say, you, well, you got 30 days to get a job when you're going back. And, and the, the law school found out that I was out. And they said, you know, do you want to come and talk to this year's students? They loved you when you was here. I said, yeah, I'll come talk to them. Cause get me out the halfway house. I'll talk to anybody you want. <laughs> so I go talk to the students, right? I, I remember I need that job or I got to go back. I shared my story. And there was a lady in the audience who ran the Hawaiian Innocence Project. She said, look here, man, I heard your story that you used to practice criminal law. She said, I know you don't want this. Yeah, I run an innocence project here. We represent people in Hawaii that's been convicted that's, that's innocent. She said, I got a, you would be perfect. I got a clerk job. It's about $10 an hour. But we were really, I know you probably don't want it. And I'm sitting there thinking, you had no idea, lady. <laughs> and I got to see what, what those spiritual principles was that I had been learning, that I, that I had been taught as a young man in Catholic school, right? But I had ignored it because I couldn't get it until I got it. And so I went there, and that's how I got my job now. Uh, uh, I'm one of the uh, uh, only criminal uh, uh, professor at a law school, right? <laughs> teaching criminal. I'm a criminal, former criminal, teaching criminal law that used to be a criminal lawyer. <laughs> now, and, and the, the, the sister talked about 2014, that was a year, because here's what happens. Uh, the, 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 the law students, I'm gonna end with this, the law students get to vote for any, the professor who they want to give their commencement speech uh, 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 at the end of the year. And after my first year of teaching, I was asked by that third year class to get a commencement speech on their behalf. And that was uh, uh, on May 18, 2014. It's coming up right tomorrow. On May 18, 2009, my sponsor drove me from Ohio to a, a medium security prison in Morgantown, West Virginia. Five years to the day. How does a man go from being driven to prison and five years later giving a commencement speech in Hawaii? <laughs> the short answer is doing a lot of drugs, but the real, <laughs> the, the real answer is God. Thank you all for letting me share. <laughs>